Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Van Heflin in Maxwell Anderson's Valley Forge on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight, the night of Washington's birthday, we are proud to present on our Hallmark Playhouse a radio dramatization of Maxwell Anderson's play, Valley Forge. Maxwell Anderson, one of America's leading playwrights and the winner of a Pulitzer Award, has a genius for clothing the stirring events of history in poetic drama. And in Valley Forge, he takes as his theme those days of destiny when the future of America hung in the balance and when everything depended on the heroism of American soldiers and the inspired leadership of their commander-in-chief, George Washington. Valley Forge is a great play by a great playwright, and, I might add, we have a great actor to play the leading role tonight, Van Heflin. And now a word about Hallmark Cards from Frank Goss, before we begin the first act of Maxwell Anderson's Valley Forge. May we remind you once again that for every occasion important to your friends and loved ones, there are Hallmark Cards to carry your thoughts across the miles across the years or merely across the way. A Hallmark card says what you want to say, just the way you want to say it. And that identifying Hallmark on the back says that you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Maxwell Anderson's Valley Forge, starring Van Heflin. It is the third winter of the Revolution. The British have taken Philadelphia, and now, up the river from General Howe, the ragged remnants of Washington's army battle the grimmest foe of all, despair. Inside one of the crude huts which serve as barracks, three soldiers spoon through their evening mess. Congress food, that's what it is. Sent straight from the Continental Congress to their Continental Army, and well they think of us, too. It's eat this or nothing. What this army needs is boots. Last night on sentry duty, the frostbite got a couple of my toes. I'm going to get me something fit to eat. <laughs> Hopeful, ain't he? I don't know where I'll find it. There's plenty of wild meat back home. Maybe, but it's a long walk to Virginia. And a deserter gets 75 lashes. If he gets caught. I aim to walk away from here while I got strength to walk. Teague! No, Teague, no! Goodbye, boys. Teague, come back here! Man, it's desertion. It... Hello? What's the trouble? Good Lord, the general himself. I believe I heard the word desertion used. Uh, we, uh, we were just talking, General Washington. I'll take care of myself and you. General, sitting here starving down to my hide and buttons isn't my idea of war. What's the harm, sir, letting us that can't be fed go home for the winter? I could shoot me some wild meat, and when spring comes, I'll be back to fight again. What is your name? Teague, sir. Well, Master Teague, you're quite right from your own angle. But this you should know. If General Howe discovers how many have already deserted, how many are sick and out of munitions, he'll come out of Philadelphia and wring our necks one by one. Every able-bodied man that owns a gun and shoes for his feet has to look like ten men if this nation is to come through the winter alive. Are we tired of this war? Do we want to quit? No, no, no. 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 I'll tell you why I'm here and why it seems to me worthwhile to stick with it while our guns rust out for lack of powder and men die around me for lack of food and medicine. What I fight for is a dream, something that's never been on this earth and never will exist unless we make it and put it there. The right of free-born men to govern themselves in their own way. It's for you to decide, Master Teague. If we lose you, if you've lost interest in this cause of yours... We've lost our war, and the men we've left dying on our battlefields died for nothing whatever. For a dream that 
came too early. General Washington? Yes. I'm sorry this happened, sir. I guess I can stand an empty belly a while longer. Valley Forge, January 16. Gentlemen, I beg of you some manner of reply to my request for food. What strange war is this? While you and your families eat well, we perish. While we bury our dead, our citizens in Philadelphia entertain the enemy. Oh, you should have loved a soldier, Master Lady. Or perhaps a general, General Hahn. <laughs> it's good advice, my dear. When I was a child, a young man came wooing from Virginia Way. We fell in love. But my parents said, no, no, this is an Indian fighter. You are rich and may turn out good looking. Let him go and catch yourself a lord. And I let him go and caught myself a captain of Marines or something of that kind. I never loved him. I wanted what I lost. The Indian fighter? The Indian fighter. The rebel Washington. Ah, now I know the identity your mask conceals. It's known that Washington once wooed a Mary Phillips. And now I would return to him. If you would but give me passport. Never. You are not to cross the lines. <laughs> and yet I will. I promise it. <laughs> I am aware, sirs, that my name no longer finds favor with the Continental Congress. General Gates wins the victories these days. And General Conway, here in my own camp, conspires to replace me. It seems my only friend is a foreigner, the Marquis de Lafayette. Major Andre. General Hart. Bad news comes tonight. The French alliance will be made with the colonies. Oh, too bad. This will give Washington great encouragement. At the very moment you've won your war, to say it botched. There's still hope. If Washington can be convinced that the French will not help... Now he knows. Not yet. We've taken the ship that brought his letters. If I can but reach him before he learns the truth... He might surrender, yes. But how's it to be done? Part by cunning but more by the innocence of love. Excuse me, Major, I, I would dance this minuet with a certain lady. Last night, there was mutiny in the 18th Regiment. This will happen again and spread. General Washington? Yes, Captain. The Marquis de Lafayette and General Varnum, sir. My compliments, Commander. You wish to see your general? I wish your advice, my friends. Upon your answer depends whether I send this letter or end my efforts. The reports before us show that we've neither food nor clothes nor arms for the maintenance of an army nor defense if we're attacked. And the British know it, too. And that our Congress is rotten. And the generals quarrel and connive to ruin you. Then think and answer carefully. My question's simple. Does this end the adventure? Is the revolution over? Or is it worth trying to hold on into spring when at least there's food to be had? It'll cost lives by hundreds, perhaps by thousands. Hold on till spring? Never. You cannot wait. I know it. Not possibly. Yet, if you knew what dreams and faith rest on you, you would do this impossible. I am a young noble, rich, spoiled, uh, perhaps not wise. I am 20 years old. I left a child wife in France whom I love. I came because the best life in all this world lives here in what you have to do. Then what is your advice? This world you have cut from the wilderness is a new world, a brighter world than was ever known in this star we inhabit. Each man is a king and walks like a king. You will find this not easy to throw away. This dream of yours and the name of Washington mean much to France. 
So long as Washington fights, France will send men and money and ships. There still is no alliance. It will come, perhaps any day. Yes, but the question is, can we wait? What's on hand? We might scratch up by equalizing three or four days' provision for every corps. Three days. Almost to nothing. But still, we have three days, and the order's given. Well, we gamble our three days on a change of luck and face what brand of hell's reserved for madmen. This is the man we heard of overseas. Then excuse me. I will go and give the order. Marquis, one moment. There was something you said that moved me strangely. You left a young wife in France. Does she mean so little to you? It is a poor love that belittles whom it loves or would hold him back from what is best and highest. If I wished to come, she would have me come. Hmm. There was a girl one time when I was 23. I might have loved so and might have loved me so. That's long ago. It came out otherwise. So, good night. Good night, Commander. General Washington? Yes, Captain. There's a woman here. She says she brings a message from General Howe. A woman? Do I know her? You did once, sir. You called me Mary. They say if one waits long enough, all things come around the circle. George? You came from Howe? A woman's stratagem. Is a woman never to follow her heart and run after him she loves or she run back Still, years? you come from Howe. I would have caught it any junket who brought me here. I came on chance. I asked for nothing. But I'm here. We'll find you lodging at the inn. But um, your message from how? His proposal is general amnesty with no surrender on either part. The Congress to receive all his petition for nothing reserved save the king's sovereignty. When you see him, tell him we intend to fight while we can. We've asked complete independence. Let me finish, sir. We have news today from Paris of the French Alliance. This is your losing year. So, the French refuse us. Yes. But, my dearest... When blows are struck, they come not singly. But still, there is love. What love I have is given. Then there is no hope. There is only hope. We in this camp have nothing more. Captain. Yes, sir? Please escort this lady to the inn and secure her lodgings. Yes, sir. Then, good night. Good night. Three days. Three years of war, and it's come to this. Three more days. We fought for a dream. Or did we but dream we fought? <laughs> Just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Valley Forge, starring Van Heflin. A kindness not expressed is a kindness lost forever. Did you ever stop to think how often one kind word changes the course of our lives? For instance, it was a kind note to a sick girl who had written a book, but whom he had never met, that started the greatest romance the world has ever known, and gave to all the generations that followed poetry that sings of that love. Yes, it was Robert Browning who sent a friendly greeting to Elizabeth Barrett on the publication of her book. And you know the rest of the story. But how often we let these gracious golden thoughts slip right through our minds. We all have moments when we'd like to say thank you or give our kind thoughts expression in some manner. Perhaps we are too rushed to write many letters, especially these busy days, but we can still keep in touch with our loved ones and friends. And the thought alone means so much so often if we give it action. You can, you know, with a Hallmark card. You'll find there's a Hallmark card to say what you want to say, the way you want to say it. That way, your kind thoughts can live forever in someone's heart. And remember that distinguished hallmark on the back adds meaning. It says you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton in the second act of Valley Forge, starring Van Heflin. A 
another bleak dawn breaks over the snowbound army at Valley Forge. While Washington waits at headquarters for the arrival of a congressional committee and hope for help, the men in the barracks simply wait. Shut that door. Hey, it's Alcock. Where were you last night? We figured you'd desert it. You figured right. And you were the one that tried to stop me yesterday. See, he's eating something. He's eating. Where'd you get that air corn? I was fixing to tell you. I stole a boat and was floating down the river to join up with General Howe. On the way, I passed one of those islands in the Delaware. All right, all right. We don't care about that. You should. It was a British island. They're using it to store hay for their horses and corn. Corn everywhere. Maybe 6,000 bushels. 6,000? But the redcoats... Oh, they got a few sentries guarding it. One of them challenged me. He's dead now. And you came back just to tell us? We're friends, ain't we? If we go, it's desertion. And if you stay here, it's starvation. All right. Let's spread the word. Let's tell the boys there's 6,000 bushels of corn pone to be had for the price of a little shooting. General Varnum, sir. No, oh, I was about to send for you, Varnum. There's, there's serious trouble. Oh, then you've heard. And one of our best companies, too. What? Well, you must refer to another matter. It's mass desertion, sir. Entire company of Virginia rifles. They've stolen boats and headed downstream. Hmm. Sorry to hear that. But there's worse. A spy has been captured. The woman who came last night from how? No. No, she came honorably and openly. This was, uh... This spy was captured with a certain letter. Here. Let me read it. Sir? Yes, Captain? Master Harvey from the Continental Congress. Oh, then Betty Mentor. General Barnum, another time for this letter. Find me General Conway. I wish him here at once. I shall tell him. General Washington? You are most welcome, Master Harvey. It's long indeed since I've exchanged ideas with Congress or its committees. And this is the committee of one. My companion took ill on the road. But still a committee. It'll hearten the troops to learn that they are not forgotten. If there are troops to hearten, I saw very few. Which brings us directly to the problem. An army cannot be held together on air. The past three months, I have begged your Congress to appoint a quartermaster, and still there is none. That is the reason for my coming, sir. General Conway is to be appointed. Conway? He is not to your liking. If it's to be Conway, I'll resign. You run things with a high hand, General Washington. Congress has yet some power over the military. You forget, sir, your star is setting. You lost at Brandywine and Germantown. I lost, Town. yes. Because first I must write a thousand letters to a thousand fools begging for the men, the arms, the food, the chance to get there late. General Conway, sir. General Washington? Master Harvey? Oh, I see you know each other. Uh, yes. General Conway, last night a British spy was taken. He bore a letter addressed to you from General Howe. This is interesting. You tell a story well. It contained the terms which would be acceptable to the English crown if the Continental Army were willing to surrender. Sir, on my word, I know nothing of that. And I, sir, on my word, say that you do and am willing to bring it to trial. You'll be held for court-martial. Mr. Harvey, we shall need your word in this. Uh, well, uh, it seems hardly wise to make a scandal uh, for the good of the service, General. For the Washington. good of the service. Look you, the evidence speaks here at the letter. Mr. Harvey, will you speak up for me, or must I speak for myself? This is most unfortunate. Mr. Harvey knows of this correspondence, and most of Congress. I was commissioned to angle for House You terms. were commissioned, you say? We must be practical, General. This war began to protect our trade, and now there is none. Under King George, at least there were some profits to be made. Sir, I should have supposed you'd notify me before negotiations were begun with the enemy. Well, there was thought of it, but you and your army have so much of the hothead in your composition. It was believed unwise to open the subject. Uh, besides, there was always doubt what reply we'd get from the British. And it seemed best not to call off our dogs until we were sure we had no need for Your dogs, you say. And is this the reason supplies have been withheld and gone astray and all our calculations upset to discourage us and call off your dogs? General Washington. Your dogs of war are yours no longer. All further negotiations with the British, I'll conduct them. You want the war ended, then, sir, we shall end it. But in our own fashion and on our own terms. <laughs> sent 
for me, sir? Your aide said it was most urgent. It is. I've written your passport and orders for an escort. But if I prefer to stay... George, what is it? I've been a gull. They've led me by a ring like a circus bear to frighten the children for them. Behind my back, they made their shabby deals. Shilling for shilling. Men's lives for copper pennies. Oh, dear George. The revolution sold out. Now I... Well, I'll make my own bargain with Hal. Return to His Excellency and tell him that I shall meet him at a time and a place of his appointment. He has made that choice already, I was to tell you. Hay Island in the Channel of the Delaware, near Sundown. Hay Island. Yes, where the British store their fodder, where once I'd hoped to raid. So be it. Of all men I have known, I least like to think of you defeated. Tell General Howe I'll be there. Goodbye, my dear. Goodbye. This should be the place. There's no other building on the island. Yes, a barn with a white flag flying. Who goes there? Generals Washington and Varnum of the Continental Army. Enter, gentlemen. General Washington, may I present General Howe? This is a strange war indeed that ends with the help of a woman. She came at my request, sir. I had heard that she was your friend and so might prevail to make you my friend. First, let it be understood that if a peace is arrived at, we gain all things for which we fought, save our independence. That is my offer. England wants you back. And Congress wishes it. So I have no choice. Listen. Miss Barnum. Gunfire. Yes. You're going to be all right, Neil. Don't bother with me, boy. I'm done for. General Washington, I thought this island was under an armistice. Bye, Harry. Hello? We got company. Generals and brigadiers. General Washington, these seem to be your men. My apologies, sir. It seems they do not know the meaning of armistice. Armistice? We've been raiding the British corn. Group. You three, sir? A whole company of Virginians, sir. We carried most of 6,000 bushels of corn back to our line. Some killed, some wounded, like Neil here. But the food's ours. Good Lord. And I reported them as deserters. Sitting. Elcock, hold me up. Yeah, here, you here, boy. Tell General Washington. <coughs> Tell him. <laughs> you can't please, sir. No. He's dying. General Washington, I suggest we One proceed. moment. One moment, please. Boy. I'm General Washington. Sir, we... We're going to win, ain't we? We got the food now. Lad, things have gone too far. I... I was afraid to die, sir, but not now. There'll be free men in a free land and no more kings. I loved you, son. Our country. That's a tough to... Die for free men in a free land. General Washington. Yes. I heard what this lad said, dying. And I'll betray you no further. The French alliance has been signed with the colonists. What? But I, I was told... The letters came yesterday. They were captured by the British. I was sent to make a dupe of you. General Howe. Uh, Never trust a woman, sir. At least, not a woman in love. This changes matters. Our war goes on. But you've lost your Congress, used for peace. Yes, by all rules of the game, we're beaten. Let our merchants submit if they will, but this ragtag which I call my army will fight on. For we're followers of a dream. A dream that men shall bear no burden save their own choosing shall walk upright, doff a hat to none, and choose their gods. It's destined to win, this dream. Even if we should fail, it is destined to win. Then there's no point in talking further. Goodbye, gentlemen. This is my last farewell, sir. I owe you thanks, madam. I know my destiny. Little though I may like it, and it's not as high as yours. There's some men who lift the age they inhabit. 
till all men walk on higher ground in that lifetime. God keep you all and bring you victory. And so we're left with some years of revolution on our hands. This liberty will look easy by and by when nobody dies to get it. We have food now for two weeks and then for two more if we can find it and two more if we can find it. And now I think we will. Heflin and James Hilton will return in a moment. Whenever you buy a greeting card, you're not only thinking of someone else, you're actually buying for others. You are selecting with someone else in mind. And to that someone else, the card you select represents you, your thoughtfulness in sending it, your good taste in selecting it. Knowing this, the makers of Hallmark cards make it easy for you to find a Hallmark card that says what you want to say, the way you want to say it. Whether it's a birthday, an anniversary, a wedding... A going away, a get well, or a please write soon. You'll find there's a Hallmark card to fit the occasion and the person you're sending it to. Is it any wonder, then, that people of good taste have a standard of comparison for greeting cards? When they buy a card, they look for Hallmark on the back. When they receive a card, they automatically turn it over to see if that familiar Hallmark is there. For that identifying Hallmark on the back says, in its own way, you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. You have made one of the tremendous characters of history live again for us, Van Heflin. Thank you for a vivid performance. Well, it's always an honor to appear on Hallmark Playhouse, Jimmy. And tonight's story, giving us a new insight into the fine character of George Washington, was particularly timely. Yes, it's the type of story we like to find for Hallmark Playhouse. A story about real people whose faith and courage inspired the lives of others. I think that explains why your program always makes one feel somehow the richer for having heard it. And Hallmark cards have that effect, too. They express such friendliness and sincerity. I'm always delighted to receive them, and I always look forward to Hallmark Playhouse. Jimmy, what have you selected for next week? Next week, Van, we shall bring you a swashbuckling story by one of America's best-loved authors when we present Booth Tarkington's Monsieur Beaucaire. And for our star, we are delighted to have Douglas Fairbanks, Jr., our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And tonight's story was adapted by Leonard Sinclair. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Van Heflin can now be seen in Tomahawk, a Universal International Technicolor production. The part of Mary Phillips tonight was played by Lorene Tuttle, Ben Wright was General Howe, Ted Osborne, General Varnum, and Ted DeCorsia, Mr. Harvey. Remember, inflation is everybody's business, and you can help fight it by buying only what you need when you need it, by paying no more than fair prices, asking no special treatment, making no under-the-counter deals, by doing a better job at your work, by not raising prices for what you sell. Remember, inflation hurts everybody, but everybody working together can kill inflation. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time, when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Douglas Fairbanks in Booth Talkington's Monsieur Beaucaire, and the week following, Blanche Chenery Perrin's Deep Wood, starring Rosalind Russell. And the week after that, Laura Ingold Wilder's The Long Winter on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.